Well, there goes all our fun. If you've never heard those words whispered when you walk in the room, you may not be a pastor. We have this way about us as if we carry something that no one else does. Maybe school teachers have this as well. I remember being at a wedding reception one time and, and being seated kind of way back at the back. And I told Mary, I said, these seats aren't that great. And she said, well, no one wants to sit by the preacher, Nelson. <laughs> this is a party. They want to have fun. I learned a long time ago that when I enter a restaurant and somebody yells, hey, preacher, it's not a greeting. It's a warning. <laughs> It's letting everyone know that, that the, the pastor's there. It's as if folks have an idea, not just about pastors perhaps, but about faith in general, that Christians are stuffy, that we are spoil sports, that we have some air of superiority about us. One of my favorite photos of my father is one where he's holding a Bible and he's preaching, and he's smiling. But what I like best about this photo is he's in a houndstooth sports jacket. I asked my dad a story about that photo one time, and he said, well, Nelson, when I was called to ministry, I, I had kind of the wrong idea about that in a way. He said, I told God, I, I will preach if that's what you want me to do. I will do funerals. I will do weddings. I will visit the sick. I will counsel but I only have one request, and this was my father's one request to God. He said, I only hope that I can wear a sports coat every once in a while. See, every pastor he had ever known wore, well, dark suits. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's just that image that he had. People somehow view the Christian life as austere and serious, and, and from time to time we need to be that way. Billy Joel said, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints, for the sinners are much more fun. That's pop culture. That, that's how it sees you and me. And in the midst of this, we come upon the 119th Psalm. that says, blessed are those whose way are blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. I like the New Revised Standard Version of this. This says, happy are those who are blameless. Happy are those who walk in the way of the Lord, because I think the world may have it wrong. According to the psalmist, right living is what brings joy. Here, as we encounter the 119th Psalm, we look at it, and did you know it is the longest psalm in Scripture? It's 176 verses. For each of the sections, it is an acrostic. The 22 Hebraic letters beginning with Aleph and ending in Ta, there are several verses of Scripture. And each and every one of these sections basically say the same thing over and over and over again. It is about the joy that comes from following God's will. Blessed, happy are those who will meditate upon God's law, upon God's word, and will follow it. We sometimes miss this joy. Why? Because we don't spend long enough in Scripture, we don't spend long enough in the presence of God to get that joy. It's not always obvious. It's not instantaneous. We live in a world where everything has to come quickly where we need instant gratification. I was talking to a 14-year-old earlier this week, and he said to me, church is boring. And I said, well, how often do you go? He said, I don't go, it's boring. Why would I go to something that's boring? But I've also talked this week to some older folks. I, I was talking to one of our older couples earlier, and these folks are those folks that can finish each other's sentences. And they said, we love to be among the people of God. We find joy in this place. We rejoice in being in the midst of God's people. 
we rejoice in hearing the word preached and open to us in Bible study. There is a closeness and a joy that only comes with time and with effort. The psalmist says this morning, blessed are those who meditate. Meditation isn't just opening up scripture and glancing through it once. It's allowing to sink deeply within our hearts and our minds. It is pondering God's goodness among us. It is seeking God's direction. It is realizing that God, who created heaven and earth, loves you and cares for you and seeks to light the way for your path. There's a television show called God Friended Me. It's, I don't know what it's about. I've never actually watched it. <laughs> I like the title, though that God has friended us. We sing the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. When we spend time drawing closer to God, there is a joy about that. But it is also a time that we realize that we too, like everyone else, have failed God. When we look at God's laws and meditate upon God's laws, we often find ourselves coming up short. And we realize that we are sinners in need of God's love and grace and forgiveness. God's direction. God's path. And so we look to Scripture to find how we might be lifted up by God. How we might be those that overcome in a sinful world. E. Stanley Jones, that great Methodist missionary, equated God's word to flying. He talked about those pilots who know the laws of aerodynamics. You know about the different forces, about weight and lift and drag and thrust. That those who know how to fly an airplane can fly wherever they want to, but he says this, he says, they are free to fly as long as they obey the laws of aerodynamics. They can't just do anything. They will stall out. Have you ever been on a plane that stalled? It's a frightening thing if you have. I one time had a friend that said that he'd like to take me flying. I said, that's great. And we got in this little plane and, and we took off and we were climbing. And all of a sudden there's a buzzer went off. And there was a voice that said, stall warning, stall warning, stall warning. And, and the plane started shaking. And I looked at him, and he was fiddling with all kinds of things. And he got it going again. And he said, it's all all right. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> Let's land this thing. Do you know what you're doing? He said, I, I, I just hadn't given enough gas. We weren't going quite fast enough. And I was trying to climb too fast. E. Stanley Jones says that's what life is like for us. We, we try to break the rules that God puts down. God gives us these that we might fly, that we might be free. But when we ignore them, we come crashing down. Things can come crashing apart in our lives so quickly. There are laws for a reason. We ride on the right side of the road here in the United States. I was in England one time, and, and, and I, I took a left-hand turn, and I got on the wrong side of the road for them, and, and there was a car coming. It was at night, and it started flashing its lights, and I thought, that idiot's on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and I realized, no, I'm the idiot on the wrong side of the road. There are laws, there are rules so that we do not run into each other. We have a, a great program on Wednesday afternoons for our children called Wonderful Wednesdays. They come after school, and one of the things that they love to do is they love to play games. They get out all of these board games. They, they play Candyland. They, they play Sorry, where, where you can knock each other back. I like to go down there and watch them, but every once in a while, little, I don't want to say fights, but heated discussions happen in these games. And Miss Melissa has to come over and say, remember the rules are this. And explains how the game 
is played. So what are these laws to which the psalmist replies? What, what, what are these rules that, that God has given us? Where to the psalmist they were the Torah, the first books of the Bible, the law of Moses, the 613 decrees. But they were centered upon the Ten Commandments. We, we know that the Ten Commandments basically have two groupings. The first is our relationship with God. And the second grouping is our relationship with one another. In, in the first four commandments, have no other gods before me. Have no graven images. Don't take my name in vain. And remember the Sabbath and keep it holy God instructs us that God must come first and foremost in our lives. If we don't get that right, nothing else will be right in our lives. God must be first and foremost. And then God says to us, but we also have to watch how we treat one another. We need to honor our parents. We, we are not to murder. We are not to commit adultery. We, we are not to steal. We are not to lie. We are not to covet. Those can also be stated in more positive ways. We are to respect life. We are to find joy in right relationships. We are to earn what it is that we need. We are to be honest. We are to find joy in what God has blessed us with instead of looking at everything else and saying, I wish I had this or that. This is how we, we find life. This is how we find joy in life. But Jesus, when he came and he talked to us to what we call the Sermon on the Mount, he said that these laws that Moses gave you, they are just minimums. If, if you do them, you're doing well, but you're only giving the minimum. Jesus pushed us to the maximums of love. He said, walk the extra mile he said turn the other cheek he said give away even your very coat he said you think you're doing well because you love your family how about loving your enemies those who are even persecuting you the psalmist says we need to think about these things a little bit I would agree we live in a time of darkness that needs some light. We live in a world that often wants to pull itself apart. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to a workshop. I'm looking forward to it. It's called Pastoral Leadership in an Age of Polarization. In, in a day when, when people seem to be on this side or that side, and, and people don't look at each other as beloved children of God, but as the days, as the other side. We tend to focus on ourselves and, and try to hope that everybody else would see it just our way instead of coming together and reasoning together in God's holy presence. And when we get to these points, instead of love and grace ruling our lives, hatred can seep in. Oh, this isn't the first time we face this kind of age. Valerie and I went to Greensboro this weekend, and while we were there, we went to the International Civil Rights Museum. If you haven't been, I hope you will go. Uh, we, we went to see that counter where those four brave young African-American men went and sat in 1960 and said, we too are human and deserved dignity. I went to see that Woolworth counter, but that's not what stuck with me. It was when you first went in to what they call the Hall of Shame. And photo after photo after photo showed what hatred can do when it's allowed to run rampant. There's a picture of Emmett Lewis Till you may remember him. He was a 14-year-old young black man. He was really more of a young boy. 
if you look at his picture, he looks a lot younger than 14. You remember he, he came down from Chicago and he went down to Mississippi and, and he went in a grocery store and, and, and some woman said that he said something and he was taken out and he was beaten and, and mutilated. And the photo, you cannot look at it long without tears coming to your eyes. The woman later in life said, oh, I lied about that. But way, way too late. Some of us live through those days of hatred, and they are not totally gone. But when I think about those dark days, what shames me the most is that for many pulpits, that type of attitude was justified. What about the world in which we live today? What about the darkness that creeps all around us? The hatred and the vileness. What about the light that we have been given to be shining examples in a world filled with hatred? Where can the love flow? The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to look way out there. We can just ask, what is the next step? We don't have lamp lighters anymore. But some of you might even remember way back in those days when there used to be gas street lamps and, and the lamp lighters were on stilts and they had a light and they would go from lamp to lamp lighting the way. You could see the light spreading down the streets. One poet said that they were punching holes into the darkness. I love that imagery that we who have been given the light of Christ can let that light shine through us. The psalmist says, meditate upon the law. Jesus told us that if we would just love God with all of our being and we'd love our neighbor just like we love ourselves, we could fulfill that law. But it's not that easy, is it? It's a lot easier to hate it's a lot easier to look out and, and to, to see the other folks and not understand. Our children in our preschool, they come together and they laugh and they play. And, and every once in a while, they, they do something wrong. We have something in our preschool called a thinking chair. <laughs> Y'all might remember it as time out. Some of us used to sit in corners. But, but that's not what's done anymore. Today, if, if you do something a little bit wrong, the teacher says, go sit in the thinking chair. There are all books written for children to read in the thinking chair. There are worksheets they can do in the thinking chair. When I read through the 119th Psalm, and I hear over and over and over again this call to meditate on God's Word, this call to truly seek with all of our heart and being what it is that God would have us to be and to do. I think God's telling us to sit down and think a little bit. That we all need that thinking chair. And when we do that, the light of God begins to dawn in our thoughts and minds. You see, when the preschoolers want to get up out of the thinking chair, you know what they have to do, don't you? They don't just have to say they're sorry. They have to be able to explain to the teacher what it is they did and what they're going to do differently. Wow, what a challenge. 
what if every time we opened the word of God, we took it seriously? We dug down deep into it, and we said, Lord, let this illumine our hearts and our minds. Let us think about our lives, and let us follow the path of light that will lead us into the joy of our Savior.